This is Larissa Ko, and today we are going to be looking at some Asian art. So an important thing to know before we begin is that culture and holding on to a culture over centuries and generation after generation is very important in Asian culture, generally. So while in Western art, it's like the newest, edgiest thing is the most popular, and those are the movements we talk about, in Asian art, it is more important to them to preserve the same traditions as they had anciently. So some of these styles that you'll see here are actually still practiced and taught and created today. The first region we're going to be looking at is East Asia. There are two types of painting that they commonly do. The first one is called Gongbi painting. This one is really detailed and colorful. You can see the paint is layered on. It looks more realistic. The texture, especially like you see here in the leaves, is really realistic. And these were done not only on paper, but also on silk. You can see a lot of these uh, amazing silk paintings hung up, kind of like a tapestry on people's walls. And also they were done on really long scrolls. So this scroll is actually over 17 feet long and you can only view a section at a time. So it's kind of cool how it shows a story or a chunk like you would see it. And then you kind of move along and can see the countryside and the city that is painted here. Over time, the artists in China who painted these scrolls started adding poetry. So you can see over here there's poetry that kind of adds to the whole effect of the painting as well. And it's just so incredibly detailed. The other style of painting is called Xi Yi painting. It is a lot less detailed and colorful, but because it's so loose, they have more creative freedom and can kind of express emotion. Both of these styles of painting were frequently done on silk and these silk paintings would be hung on the wall kind of like a, a tapestry. Um, again we see a lot of nature and that is such an important part of Asian culture and is therefore depicted in their artwork. We see artists from Japan, Korea, and China all producing somewhat similar artwork and they would have these red ink stamps that was kind of their, their signature that they would put on the paintings as well. Another common symbol that we see is the koi fish. Not only does it have to do with nature, but it's meaningful to their culture and seen as lucky. A totally different style of art that we have from China is these terracotta soldiers. So the emperor was buried with an entire army to protect him in the afterlife, complete with horses and everything. Uh, they're very individual. Each one has a different face. These were discovered somewhat recently, and what a cool discovery. East Asia is very well known for its porcelain. Porcelain is a type of ceramics, so it's clay, but it's really thin and fine. And the things that they created with it were so delicate that a lot of times you could see the light shining through the porcelain. The most famous style was this blue and white style with various different patterns. We see a lot of dragons, which is a huge uh, Chinese symbol. But there also were other styles um, in different colors of glazes that they would use. And not only did they not only did they use it to create pottery and dishes, but also figurines. This one is a Japanese figurine of a lion with a ball. Porcelain was well known not only in East Asia, but throughout the world. A lot of these styles were duplicated and these practices were replicated in the West, like in England. It first appeared in the Han Dynasty in 206 BCE. Another medium that Asian artists frequently use, even to this day, is jade. Jade is this beautiful green stone, and we see it used here as beads, so more of a utilitarian purpose. We see jade carvings or pendants that are hung on this crown from Korea. 
This one is more of a large sculpture of a horse all the way from 25 to 220 AD. And this is a smaller pendant of a jade dragon. And this one is the oldest one that we have here, 202 BCE. Jade is believed to have protective qualities. Uh, so you can see why people would want to have jade on them and their buttons or their crown or their pendant. And then it was often buried with its owner, kind of like the terracotta soldiers. They believed that they could bring these things to the afterlife and they would take their jade with them. Speaking of the afterlife, ancestor worship uh, is a really important part of Chinese culture and they would create what's called ritual bronzes. Um, these bronzes are really intricate. You can see the detailing on these and often they would place uh, food and drink into these bronzes and then offer it up to their gods in, ce in ceremonies, their gods and their ancestors. Then when the owners of these bronzes would die, they would be buried with them. All of these vessels were found around an altar in China, and you can just see the amazing abilities that they had to work with bronze at the time. Uh, Japanese woodblock printing. So what woodblock printing is, uh, is the artist would start out with a block of wood, as you may have guessed, and then they would carve out a part of the painting. Then they would apply one color onto paper by putting ink on it and pressing it down with a roller or some other fashion. Uh, and then once they were done with that color, they would carve more out of the block and then apply the next color. So like you can see over here in this one, we have the white, which may have been the white of the paper. Um, then we have this light blue. Uh, we have the green, the red, the dark blue, and this would have been done in steps onto the same piece of paper. Sometimes the artist would create just one uh, print from their wood block, and sometimes they would create multiple. You can see in these Japanese wood block prints, especially this one up here, again, there's this uh, balance of nature and, and humanity that we see as a theme. So it's just a beautiful landscape with the trees and the water. And then we also have the humanity aspect of it. Uh, we have these bits of architecture and then the tiny people right here. It kind of shows that nature is in control and humans are kind of just a small part of it. Um, and then here we can see that as well. This is a really famous painting, probably the most famous of all Japanese woodblock prints. This is called The Great Wave off Kanagawa and this was done by Hakusai in 1830. So we see this huge wave and you may have seen this a hundred times and not even notice that there are people in boats right here as well. So we really see the whole nature is in control um, aspect of that in here. There were a lot of Japanese woodblock, woodblock prints that kind of painted a picture of an in-the-moment scene. Um, so this is, kind of looks like just a family hanging out one day, some dancers in the background. Um, we see people on a bridge over here. This style of painting, um, the kind of flattened style with people in everyday life, really influenced Western artwork as well at the time. This was created in 1745 in Japan. When we look at East Asian architecture, I think the thing that stands out to me the most is these uh, sweeping rooftops, which are just a really cool style that we see throughout uh, Eastern Asia. And also these carvings. There are all kinds of animals and creatures like dragons carved into uh, Buddhist temples and pagodas and things like that in East Asia. This ties into the idea of Feng Shui, meaning the balance of humanity and nature. Um, so not only did they carve animals into their architecture, but they also were, were really conscious of the nature around the architecture. They would often build, uh, build their temples, uh, build their temples backed up against mountains or facing water. 
And in Japan, they have this tradition of the Japanese Zen garden, which really would bring nature into architecture and everyday life. Symmetry is another important aspect of Feng Shui. So if you see you divide these along the center, they would be the same on both sides. And that just goes back to the idea of harmony and balance. Okay, let's travel to South Asia. You'll see some similarities, but mostly some pretty significant differences between these East Asian artworks and now South Asia. Um, so Buddhism is a major influencer in, in South Asia, Asian artwork. In Buddhist artwork, what you want to look for is Buddha. He's all over the place. The other thing that you'll see over and over again, even though these are very different styles, is this circle. Whether it's 2D art like this or uh, sculptures like these, one, like these ones, we still see that mandala. Hinduism is now the most popular religion in India. In India and Nepal and Mauritius as well. Hinduism is a polytheistic religion, so they have many gods that kind of serve different purposes. A lot of a lot of people will kind of choose their favorite god that they connect with and want to keep representations of that god near them and also uh, worship them at the temples. And we can see that these gods were created all over the area and in all different materials as well. Um, this one is a stone carving from Vietnam. These two are both made out of bronze, which you see kind of turns green over time. This one's from Thailand and this one is from India. Um, this Nepali sculpture might be my favorite. It's made of copper, of a copper alloy and it also has inlaid stones. Um, so these were placed into the little statuette um, and I just love the movement that they have in this art, especially if you compare it to Buddhist art, which was all about meditation and peace and calm. And then we go into the Hindu art and there's a lot more dancing and movement. Um, this, this one is of Krishna killing the horse demon. Um, so you can see that there's a very different style between the Hindu artwork and the Buddhist artwork. Um, this one was made out of terracotta, so the same material that the terracotta soldiers were made out of. And the third religion that really influenced artwork in this area is Islam. And so Islamic architecture is based on the belief that it's not right to have images of people. So they didn't have idols like they would have in Hindu religion. Instead, they would create really beautiful floral patterns um, and kind of create their artwork out of their architecture and their um, calligraphy or writing in a lot of cases as well. Um, so we have these floral designs here. There are some more geometric ones as well. Um, and the Taj Mahal is the most famous building in India, one of the most famous in the world as well, because look at it. It's just amazing. It's uh, made it's covered in marble and the color of it kind of changes based on the lighting throughout the day um, the islamic architecture influences include like i was talking about these floral type of designs that it's covered in and also this dome shape was really popular in islamic architecture as well this uh, taj mahal was created or commissioned by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan as a memorial to his wife. Um, so here's a painting of Shah Jahan and his wife who died. She he was devastated and commissioned this amazing building to be created. And uh, to this day, their tombs are still inside of the building. Now we travel to Southeast Asia. So these are found in Cambodia. They are called relief sculptures. Relief sculptures are not like 3D sculptures that you could walk around like this or hold. Um, instead, relief sculptures are carved into surfaces. In this case, these are all part of the arch architecture. So they're carved into buildings and they have religious and political themes like a lot of them do and just a lot of really cool details um, we have a lot of stylized 
uh, parts of it. It's not super realistic, but you can see just the level of detail and work that went into these carvings. They were created all the way back in the Khmer Empire between 802 and 1431. Um, but they have survived to the present day, and you can go look at them in Acre in Cambodia. The architecture of Southeast Asia is pretty different from that in East Asia. The architecture was really influenced by religions as well, specifically the Buddhist and Hindu religions had a huge impact on the architecture. A lot of times religious buildings are the ones that people invested time and money into, and so that's why they're the most amazing buildings that exist from the old age, because again, that was what was most important to them. Um, so they were built to be used as places to worship. A lot of them have large pavilions so that a lot of people could congregate at once to pray. And the insides of these temples were built so that their voices would reverberate off of the building interior and make the prayers louder so they could really hear. These are my resources. If you want to look more closely into any of these as well, you can click on the links. Um, to learn more about the individual artworks. Thanks for watching.